So this is lesson 8.5, and we are going to explore the third and last um, equation for quadratics called intercept form. And the good news about this is that it really goes back to everything we did in chapter 5, because intercept form is just another word for factored form. So if you look at what this, um, this equation looks like right in here, notice that it's just the factored version of those standard form trinomials. So every time back in chapter 7 when we took that trinomial and we did that magic number trick and we, you know, split the middle term factor by grouping and we rewrote that trinomial as a product of two binomial factors, this is what you were getting into here. And we knew that once we had those binomial factors, we could set each factor equal to zero and find those x-intercepts, those zeros, those roots, right? So all intercept form is is just the factored version of our quadratic equation, okay? And just like the others, it has some nice advantages, okay? When you are in this intercept form, the information that this one provides, just at a quick glance, is the x-intercepts, okay? So we already knew, we had done that before, we had like maybe x plus 3, and when you set that equal to 0, you knew that your intercept was at negative 3. Or if it said x minus 7, you knew when you set that equal to 0, you would add on both sides and you'd have positive 7. So that P and that Q are the x-intercepts of your graph. We also call them the roots, the solutions, um, the zeros. But graphically speaking, they give you the x-intercepts. They give you two good valuable points that a lot of times are meaningful in the word problems. Okay, But they also give you the axis of symmetry in a pretty quick and easy way. Okay, So once you have those two intercepts, the idea is those two intercepts are directly horizontal of each other. So right in between them lives that axis of symmetry. So if you just take those two x-intercepts and you average them together, it'll always give you the location of your axis of symmetry. It'll always be right in between the x-intercepts. And not only that, but you also know that also gives you the x-coordinate of the vertex, right? So the big idea here, kind of one of the big advantages, is it gives you the x-intercepts at a glance and, write that down, the axis of symmetry is the average. of those x-intercepts. Okay? And again, once you have that, you also have the x-coordinate of the vertex. And then once you have the x-coordinate, you can plug it back in and get the y-coordinate. So then it gives you really some important points right at a glance. So let's try a few. So it says find the x-intercepts and the axis of symmetry of the graph of the function. So these are nice. They're already in intercept form for us. Bless you. Okay. They're already in intercept form for us. So the idea here is to find the intercepts. If you, we were showing the work every time, this is what it would look like. To find those intercepts, I would basically be taking this function and setting it equal to zero. And then we would use a zero product property. We would say, okay, the only way this times this is equal to zero is if either x plus 2 is equal to 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. Both of those scenarios would make this true, right? And then we would solve each little mini equation, and we would find that one of our x-intercepts is a negative 2, and the other x-intercept is at 4, okay? If you think of this, though, in terms of that intercept form, that y equals x minus p and x minus q, you kind of, you, you know, it's kind of like with the h value inside of the vertex form, you can skip this work and just look straight at that x plus 2 and realize, okay, if, if this first binomial right here is x minus p and I have x plus 2, that tells me p must be negative 2. Right? And if I see here that x minus 4 is the other factor, and I know that's x minus q, that tells me q must be 
four. And so there's my two intercepts, and I can kind of skip all of this work. We did it back in chapter seven. That was great. This is really the why it works. But the shortcut is just to look at P and Q in the formula, okay? So once we have the x-intercepts, that takes care of one of the uh, requests here. So that takes care of x-intercepts. Check. Axis of symmetry can easily be found from these guys by just averaging them. So now for that axis of symmetry, I'm going to take the average. That means I'm going to add them up and divide by how many there are. So there's two of them, okay? So negative 2 plus a positive 4 divided by 2. And negative 2 and a positive 4 is 2, and 2 over itself is 1. So our axis of symmetry is at x equals 1. Okay? That's the vertical line that splits our parabola right in half. Okay? So you take the average of the zeros there. Let's try the next one on number 2. Maybe on number 2 we might just skip this work since we know the format, right? So we know that the format of our parabola or, sorry, of our intercept form is A, parentheses, X minus P, parentheses, X minus Q. One of the things that we haven't talked about yet is A is still right there in front. A is always very beneficial to know and to, to you know, gives you good characteristics. So it's always that coefficient out in front as well. So that negative 3, I know already, it's going to make it open downward. It's going to make it look narrower. But what I'm interested in right now is really just those X-intercepts which are the P and Q. So for the x-intercepts, what would we get for, do that. So one of my x-intercepts is the value of P here. What would that be? Two, right? And the other x-intercept would be the other value of Q here, which would be three. There it is. So there's my x-intercepts. Okay. For phase two of this, we'll find the axis of symmetry by simply averaging those together. So if I do 2 plus 3 and I divide that by 2, 2 plus 3 is 5, and 5 over 2 is 2.5. So my axis of symmetry for this parabola is at x equals 2.5. Okay, give me some thumbs up or down. How do we feel about those? Are we okay? Yeah. You can leave it as a fraction. I am a huge, you all know I'm team fraction all the way. However, when it comes to graphing, when I'm going to go graph a line, I think it's easier for me to think about where 2.5 is than when, where 5 over 2 is. You know what I mean? So although it can go either way, it's user's choice, this is the one time in graphing that I would say decimals are probably a better friend to you than fractions. I'll say that very few times, <laughs> but this is one of them. But it doesn't really matter as long as your line is in the right place. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? If, that there's an X term but not added or subtracted to anything? Okay, then that would have just one intercept, and it, was probably, it, it basically means you don't have a quadratic in front of you. Okay? Um, you're looking at a linear. All right, so let's play with exactly the same stuff, but this time we're going to actually create our parabola. We're going to graph it. Okay? So we're still going to find really those big characteristics. Where are those intercepts? Where's the vertex? Where's the axis of symmetry? And we'll use that to graph our parabola. Okay, so look at number three. Graph the quadratic function, label the vertex, axis of symmetry, x-intercepts, and describe the domain and range. Okay, so let's start with, I would say let's start with the intercepts here. So just one more reminder, I know that if this is in intercept form, also known as factored form, I can really just look at that and hopefully be able to pluck out both of those intercepts by just identifying what P and what Q are, okay? So if I find those x-intercepts, in this case, it would be x equals, what would be our first one here? Negative 5, right? It's the opposite of the sign you see there. So we have one x-intercept at negative 5, and the other one is at negative 1. Okay, awesome. So that's check, you know, we can say, okay, well, that took care of that. Wherever they are, there's the exercise. Okay, let's do axis of symmetry since we already have those guys in front of us. So for the axis of symmetry, we're going to take the average of these. So I'm going to add negative 5 plus the negative 1 and take that result and divide it by 2. Turns out negative 5 plus a negative 1 is negative 6 
over 2, which just simplifies to negative 3, right? So now we know that our axis of symmetry is at x equals negative 3. Okay, that takes care of this guy. Awesome. Now I need to find the vertex, but by finding the axis of symmetry, I also already found what? The x coordinate of our vertex, right? So now, if I come here to work on my vertex, right, I already know half the work here. I know that the vertex x coordinate is negative 3, and I'm really just trying to find what is the corresponding y output. How do I solve for that? We just plug in that negative 3 for x, okay? So we're going to take m of x and turn it into m of negative 3. We're just going to plug in a negative 3. So my parentheses, instead of it being x plus 5, it's going to be negative 3 plus 5 and negative 3 plus 1. And let's just be gentle with your PEMDAS here or gentle in putting it in the calculator, putting your parentheses where they go, right? What's negative 3 plus 5? That's going to be 2. So this first factor is 2. And then what's negative 3 plus 1? Negative 2. And those are right up against each other by multiplication. So when I multiply that, I get that the output must be negative 4. So now I know that my vertex is at negative 3, negative 4. I think we have all the ingredients we need to graph this now. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I see there's stuff on the negative side, so I might make my axis a little bit further this direction, maybe a little bit higher here, Just to give myself space. Okay, so I've been modeling this this entire unit. It's not going to change. The first thing I want to do is mark a dash, imaginary line, if you will, for my axis of symmetry and label the equation for that. So that's at equals negative 3 x equals, I mean, negative 3. Uh, vertex is at negative 3, negative 4. So that is going to be right here, and I label that negative 3, negative 4. I also already have the two intercepts. That gives me a few other points. So I know that my parabola intercepts the x-axis at negative 1 and negative 5. Okay. And I can just connect them and make my U-shaped curve. Okay, there's my parabola. What does our domain for all the problems look like this? All real numbers, right? Unless it's a word problem. So for this one, our domain is all real numbers. Our range is going to be all the y values that are greater than or equal to negative 4. Good. All right, there it is. Okay, that took care of everything. Try number four on your own. All right, so I gave you guys a head start. Let's see if we start with the um, x-intercepts. Did you guys get x equals 3 and x equals 1? Okay, those are our intercepts because that would be the value of p here and the value of q would be 3 and 1. So those are our x-intercepts. Okay. Uh, for the axis of symmetry, we will average those. So for that, we will do the 3 plus the 1, and then take that quantity and divide it by 2. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So our axis of symmetry is at x equals 2. Okay. Then for our vertex... Our axis of symmetry doubles as an x-coordinate. And I'm going to plug in to find the y-coordinate. So I'm just going to take this y equals negative 4x. I'm sorry, negative 4. And then I'm going to plug in 2 for x. So this is really important that you still have that negative 4 there when you compute that output, right? So we've got negative 4, 
2 minus 3 is negative 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. So what did y'all get for your y-coordinate here, guys? 4. Good. Did y'all get 4? So that your full vertex is 2, 4? Okay. Go ahead and let's graph that. We have... over a little bit this way. So axis of symmetry is a 2. X equals 2. Um, vertex is at 2, 4. Okay. Um, the um, intercepts are at 3 and 1. And that should be plenty of information for us to graph our parabola. What's our domain? All real numbers. So domain is all real numbers. And our range is otherwise at R less than or equal to positive 4. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. What do you notice is different? We're, our task is still the same. We're still going to graph this and find those x-intercepts, axis of symmetry, vertex. But what do you think is different about these when you look at the equation? Is that? It's not factored, right? So we need to write that in intercept form. So we're going to use the same factoring skills that we had before. Dylan? Yeah, sign out. OK. So think about how you might factor that. That is all review from the last unit. What's that? You have to factor it. Yeah. Okay, so let's start a quick review if you need to go um, visit your flow chart. But this is what we did in Unit 7. And as promised, as always, what you did before, you're going to need for later, right? So let's take a look at number five and review. First of all, what's step number one, no matter how we factor? What's always the first step? Check for a GCF, right? Is there a GCF, right? This is already simplified. We, we're actually going in the opposite direction of simplifying. We're factoring it out. So is there a GCF between x squared and negative 4? No, but always check for that, right? Uh, task number two, how many terms does this have? Two. So remember, when we only have two terms, after we have checked for a GCF, we are done, unless it's the special case of difference of perfect squares. Is this mm, a difference of two perfect squares? Yes, it is, right? So that does factor further, and you just have to know that for uh, that uh, pattern. So we know that this will factor to the square roots added together and the square roots subtracted. Now we are in intercept form. That's it, right? So told you, yo, you, we need to know the factoring, right? So there it is. So we just factor the polynomial, and then we have it in that intercept form. And now we can just run with it like we did before. Where, where are x? x-intercepts going to be here? Yeah, they're going to be at negative 2 and positive 2. Okay, axis of symmetry will be the average of those. Yep, which will equal 0 over 2, which is just 0. So our axis of symmetry is at the vertical line x equals 0. Okay. Then we'll find our vertex. So we already know the x-coordinate of the vertex is 0. We're just looking for the corresponding y. Okay? So we're going to just plug in 0 for x and solve. Do you think it matters if we put it into the original or the factored version? It shouldn't. It better not matter. If I did that correctly, those two equations are the same. They're just diff written differently. So it shouldn't matter whether you plugged in the 0 into the x squared minus 4 version, or if you plugged it into the factored version that says y is equal to x plus 2 and x minus 2. They should both give you the same answer. Okay? So on this one, 0 squared is still 0 with 0 minus 4. Negative 4. On the other one, this would be 2 times negative 2, which is 
negative 4. So it doesn't matter which one you plug it into. You pick. Okay? But we now know the rest of our vertex, and we're ready to graph. So just for the um, sake of time, I'm going to go a little bit faster here. We've been graphing for a while, so hopefully you all feel comfortable knowing where I'm going with this. Our axis of symmetry happens to be right at x equals 0, right on top of the y-axis on this one. Okay? Our vertex is at 0, negative 4. 1, 2, 3, so it's down here. And we also know that we have intercepts at positive 2 and negative 2. And there's our parabola. Okay? So, what's our domain? All real numbers. Okay? And what is our range? All the y's that are? Yeah, all the y's that are greater than or equal to negative 4. Okay. How about number 6? I think at this point, just because of time, we have, do you all feel comfortable with the graphing piece of this? Okay, so I'm going to review with you how to factor that trinomial, because it's been a few weeks. But then we won't, you know, the rest of it will be the same as all the ones we've been practicing. But the thing on number six is, once again, just like number five, that is not in intercept form. So I want to rewrite it in a factored form so I can look at those intercepts, right? So first of all, again, what's step one no matter what? Look for a GCF, right? So is there a GCF among all three of those terms? No, but always check for that. Okay, how about... How many terms it has? How many terms does that have? It has three. So think about the methods that we use. When we had a trinomial, we did the magic number trick. Okay? And we did that 1 times a negative 15. Since this is a 1, it's a shorter version. So 1 times negative 15 is still negative 15. We're looking for two factors of negative 15 that combine to 2. Any ideas? It's a positive 5 and a negative 3. Next time, raise your hand. So positive 5 and a negative 3. And because it's the shorter version, that's all I needed. I can now rewrite this as the two binomials, x plus 5 and x minus 3. And the rest is history, right? We pick out our axis intercepts. We average them, get our axis of symmetry. Plug it back in, get your vertex. Da -da -da -da. Okay? So, but that's what you would do. Just a quick review on how you factor those trinomials. Are we okay with that one? Okay. Moving on. So these are actually a little nicer. They're still practicing primarily the factoring, OK? We're still looking for the zeros, which is the same thing as the x-intercepts, except we don't have to graph afterwards. Okay, So it's a lot like we just did on number six. So quick review. We'll just do it again. If we are going to rewrite this in intercept form so we can select those zeros, which are the same as the x-intercepts, the first thing I'm going to do is look for a GCF. So on number 7, it has a GCF of 6. That's right. Okay. So I know that I can factor a 6 out of this binomial. And when I do that, it leaves me with x squared minus 1. Awesome. Okay. There's that A value hanging out in front of the parentheses, right? So you start to see how this kind of develops, right? Um, and then how many terms did we have? 2, right? So we are done unless this is a difference of perfect squares. Is this a difference of two perfect squares? Well, of course it is, right? So we know that x squared is a perfect square, and we know 1 is a perfect square. So the square root of those is going to be my answer. 1 will be a sum. 1 will be a difference. So I know one of my factors will be x plus 1, and the other factor will be x minus 1. And there I am in intercept form. I can see a, I can see p, I can see q. Okay, it's in full intercept form. And I can find the zeros because the zeros are the same thing as the x-intercepts. It's just another word for x-intercept. So that's going to be essentially what our values of p and q are. So in this case, those are at what? What's p and what's q here? 1 and negative 1. Perfect. Yeah. Right? So there it is. No, because it doesn't have an x value. So that's never, so the 6, if this had an x in it, then yes, you would make, 0 would be one of them. But if it's just the constant 6, when I think in terms of zero product property, 6 times whatever isn't going to make this 0. I can't set equal to, z, uh, I can't set 6 equal to 0, right? So I don't have to worry about it if it's just a constant. 
All right, number seven, is there, I'm sorry, number eight, is there a GCF? No GCF. Okay, um, how many terms does it have? So we're going to do magic numbers. Okay. So think about what are two factors of 20 that combine together to give us a 9. Don't yell it out. Let people think about it. Whatever those numbers are, that's going to fill in my two binomial factors. Okay. Okay. You'd be done. You would just set it equal to zero and try to solve for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, what'd you get? Positive five and positive four. That's exactly right. So positive five and positive four combine and multiply to 20, but combine to nine. So these are our two binomial factors. And now we're in, in sorry, now we are in intercept form. That means that our zeros or x-intercepts are located at x equals negative 5 and x equals negative 4, because that would be the value of p and the value of q. Give me some thumbs up, down. How do we feel? Okay, what we done? So pay attention to this one. I'm going to put a little star next to it. Okay, this is a little bit like the one that we did at the beginning of class, number 58, that y'all asked about the homework but instead of vertex is intercepts. Nonetheless, it's, okay, you can definitely expect to see that on your test, okay? This kind of pro question, okay? So we want to write the quadratic function in standard form. So note that, that's important. We'll get to that whose graph satisfies the given conditions. So all we're told is that our quadratic passes through negative 4, 0, and through 3, 0, and through 2, negative 18. Okay? Here's the deal. Those first two points they gave us, the fact that y is equal to 0 there, what does that tell me about those first two points? What are they? Yeah. They're the x-intercepts. So by giving me these first two points, they just gave me the values of P and Q. Okay. Now think about what that looks like. That right away tells me that intercept form is probably a really good candidate to at least get started. It might not be the standard form I'm going to end up in, but it's a really good place to start because I know I can use that P and that Q, those two values, uh, right in. Okay. And then I'll move it to standard in a moment. But there's another variable I need, and this is the predict. This is what we just did when we were going over the homework. What else do I need also? A, right? And that's where this other x and y come in, just like the homework last night. I can borrow that ordered pair to fill in for x and y temporarily so I can solve and find what A is. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to use that x and y. I'm going to fill in temporarily for x and for y so I can solve for a here. I also already know that p is negative 4, so when I do minus a negative, that really becomes positive 4 in my equation. Okay? And minus q, well, q is just 3, so there it is. So I'm just basically filling in everything we know so we can solve for a. You should be ready on the test to do that both on vertex form, which is the one we practiced on last night's homework before the lesson, and also for intercept form. Either one of these could be uh, thrown at you on the test, okay? And we've got to solve for A. So let's solve for A here. I know 2 plus 4 simplifies to 6, and 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6, so this is where I'm at. And then to solve for A, all I have to do is divide both sides. Okay. A happens to be 3. Okay. So now I can write the actual real equation in intercept form. I go back to x's and y's, but I know A is 3. And we had already established that P was a negative 4 and Q was 3. It doesn't matter which one you put in for P and Q as long as they're both there. 
And if they had not specified which form, or if they had said write it in intercept form, I would be done here. Unfortunately, they said standard form. So standard form is a reverse of the factoring we were doing. We're just going to FOIL this. That's it. Okay, we FOIL this. Standard is the simplified version of all this stuff. Okay, so we can do this. Basically, we're just multiplying these three things together. It doesn't matter what order you do it in. I like to do the FOILing with smaller numbers, so I'm going to leave the three for later. But if you wanted to multiply one of these by three first and then FOIL, you could. Multiplication is commutative. It doesn't matter what the order. Okay. So I will FOIL first, because I like to keep my number small as long as possible. I'll leave the 3 there, and I'll do my first outer inner last here. So my first product is x squared. Then I get negative 3x. Then I get positive 4x. And I get a negative 12. And then we know that these guys usually combine together. I get x squared, a positive x, and a negative 12. So now that I've multiplied the two binomials, now I just multiply the 3 in. And I just distribute it in. And it turns out that the standard form of this equation is 3x squared plus the 3x minus 36. Okay? And there's the answer.